so I'm Vidya, and my colleague who's sitting over there is Ashley. Wave, Ashley. <laughs> so um, I pointed out to Ashley that his middle initials were JS. How cool is that? You know, like, so this is brilliant. Um, so the machines are talking. Um, one or two of you may have heard the M2M jargon. What is M2M? M2M just stands for machine to machine. Um, you may have heard of the Internet of Things, and the Internet of Things is dependent on machine to machine. So some people think this is like very new, but actually machine to machine has been going on for a, a very long time. And it's really about the idea of without human intervention, you know, passing information from one type of device to another device to do remote monitoring, control, and things like that. Uh, examples of M2M abound in, in, in the millions. Uh, I could spend the next hour talking about all the different types of M2M. I mean, sometimes, uh, for a joke, people talk about fridges and toasters and things like that. Oh, isn't that so funny? Um, actually, it's really very real. So cars coming out now will have sensors in them monitoring how you drive. This is likely to impact you know, future insurance models, you know, how much you're going to pay for your insurance. Um, water monitoring. Um, there are all sorts of interesting devices now coming on the market and sensors that water companies are using um, to, to figure out whether there are pressure losses in the system. For example, another example is, uh, a cool example is farmers having sensors uh, spread out uh, over their farmyards, their, their, their farms, to figure out which bit of their um, land needs watering at any one particular time. So you optimize how water is um, uh, which pumps go on and which go off at what time of day. And you do this dependent not just on the time of the day, but on how you sense how much moisture is in the ground. Um, th th there are examples in energy, health, and device management. But I think one of the more interesting examples, um, if you're in the United States, you might know about the um, and this thing called a glow cap. So, little device, put tablets in there, and this tells you, um, it, it will tell somebody what time and when they're supposed to take their tablets, and it will remind them, um, older people, for example. So, this will call you, this, will, this can text you, this can um, uh, create reports, it can let your doctor know what you're doing, it can tell, um, you know, family members, what's going on. And the interesting thing is, um, apparently, uh, around half of the population of the US is under some form of medication. And most of those people don't take their pills and medicines uh, correctly and rightly at the right time of the day, uh, or e even finish their courses. And the they end up having to take more pills as a consequence. So they pay both in terms of uh, their own lives and the amount of money that they have to spend. So it's a very interesting uh, example of machine to machine and sensors. And uh, another interesting example is um, increasingly what we're seeing is companies are now talking about putting SIM cards into household goods. So, for example, you've got a coffee maker. What you start to do, the manufacturer does, is he monitors your coffee maker. And he will then uh, text you, telling you that it, a part needs changing, replacing, and things like this. And similar things are happening in the washing machine area. So, it's not fantasy stuff. 
this is what is happening today. Um, this market, um, if you do a Google search, people talk in every day that you go in uh, and look, the figures change. So, you know, it's a few million today, and people are now talking about 50 billion connected devices. So, regardless of, you know, exactly what number it is, it's big and it's getting bigger. So people are coming up with more and more examples. But the vast majority of the things that I've said are things that big companies are doing. Uh, they're not really open source, um, but the world is ready to change. And it's changing because, partly because of this small boy, the Arduino, um, which I'll zoom into. It's, it's just basically an 8-bit controller. Um, this 8-bit controller, 16 megahertz 8-bit controller, which is, which is one of the first ones, um, allows you to connect arbitrary sensors to it. So in the two chaps who, who designed this, designed it for people who are not technical. And what they figured was, if we make this and push this out into the market, and people can just connect it up to their computers, they can connect it up to all kinds of sensors. And, and an awful lot of great new ways of doing things have come about as a consequence. So this is open source hardware. So you open source the hardware, and then you open source the software associated with that. And that's what Arduino is all about. The first Arduino was a tiny device which fits into your hand. Um, came out in 2005. This is the Arduino that I use, uh, the Arduino 2560. Um, it's actually the main difference between this one and the previous one is that this one has 256 kilobytes of memory and the previous one that I just showed you had 32 kilobytes of memory. They're only 16 megahertz machines. To get an idea of how easy this is to use, so when I got this in the post, uh, I unbundled it, plugged it into my laptop, um, downloaded the appropriate software, and had a light blinking inside 20 minutes. Okay, so this is very easy to use, and over 300,000 units have been sold, and even more are going, so a new device is about to come out. Nobody knows exactly what it is. There's lots of gossip and rumors uh, associated with that. There's another device uh, called the Embed, which is less well known. Um, uh, more powerful, and it's got ARM behind it. So this particular device is a little bit more expensive, but significantly more powerful. Um, and one of the things that this, th these guys realized was we need to have a central repository for software. So this is not on GitHub, as far as I know. It's uh, Mercurial. Um, but they put an online compiler and tool chain, and if you want to find about it, you just go to embed.org, and there's a one-stop shop to develop software. You go in, compile, download onto your device, whatever you want to do. And we liked this so much that we decided we needed to put a cellular connection onto it which at the end of this month uh, is going to be fully open sourced. It turns out that if you can go and, and buy any dongle you want and stick it in, and it may or may not work on one of these devices. So if you want to have connectivity, um, it's better to go to a device that you know is going to work. And Vodafone has this one. And as I said, at the end of the month, it's fully open sourced. Uh, so you will be able to do whatever you want with that particular software. Um, there are an awful lot of devices. You may have heard of the uh, Raspberry Pi. So this, again, is another game changer in this space, but this is a full-fledged computer. Um, uh, 700 megahertz machine. Um, the, the, oh. There we go. 
these are the uh, pins which I could connect sensors and devices to. This is really tiny. I should have brought mine with me. It's the size of an Amex card. I can take it and put it on, an Amex, on a credit card, and I have a, you know, a complete Linux-based computer which connects to the whole world, and I can do anything what I want with it for 25 pounds. Um, there are many other machines out there. Um, I th I'm not sure how the dynamics are going to work out. If you have a Raspberry Pi, it's not so clear to me that you necessarily need an Arduino uh, and or an embed. Um, but um, it's you know it's one part of a tool. It might not. It might be too much for the job that you are interested in. Sorry, <laughs> I went too forward. So I haven't said anything at all about Node.js so far. Uh, and this is not really a code talk. So this was all about open sourcing hardware. And if you, and if you put that together with open source software, you, you increase the number of people who are going to actually use this. Um, it's incredibly easy to get going with the Arduino. You know, so there's a, a fantastic JS uh, module, no JS module, um, written by, uh, I can't pronounce his name, Gaultier from Voxer, um, J. Gaut Gaultier, Gaultier from Voxer, who's written this very simple, um, excuse me, Yeah, he's written this very simple, uh, uh, it's not that simple, it's simple to use is what I should say, a very simple to use um, uh, module. So require Fermata gets you going, and in just Fermata is the name of the protocol, um, and it, it, there's a dependency on serial port. Again, if, if you have this, then you can just speak using Node.js to one of these devices very quickly, very fast, and off you go. Um, uh, Ashley uh, put this thing together. It's, it's a bit of a mess. It looks like a mess anyway, but he's a messy sort of chap, so. Um, you know, uh, so it's a little camera. Um, You know, you know, in programming, there's this hello world thing, and uh, for me, the hello world in these sorts of devices is a blinking light. But uh, uh, Ashley is is a big boy, and he's not interested in uh, lights, and so he just thought, let me go away and put a camera on this thing. Um, and he ended up spending a lot more than half an hour because the drivers didn't work. And these are the sorts of things that you discover. So he, he put one of these. Ooh, that doesn't look very nice there. It looks nicer on my screen. <laughs> yeah, so uh, he, 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 he put this all together in, in, in about two days. And basically, um, y you know, you can control this camera. Um, uh, and it just uses Node.js. It's got a server there, the web server, and all the rest of that kind of stuff, uh, very, very easily in a couple of days. Um, there's a whole bunch of lessons that we've learned in building these sorts of systems. Uh, I'm not talking about those big systems. I'm talking about the ones with the Arduinos. But, uh, but the bottom line is you have to think beyond just writing little bits of code. You've got to think about the whole system end to end. So we're so used to plugging in our stuff, but we forget where these devices might actually be. So for example, you know, um, is there a power source? Uh, once you build one of these M2M -M devices, are you going to be able to access it again? Um, uh, and, and if you're going to be able to access it, how frequently are you going to be able to access it or not? You know, you have to think about the network and the amount of data that you've, you send 
So we're used to sending bits of JSON and we think, oh, this is no big deal, you know, 33 kilobytes, oh, fantastic. But now you have a connectivity plan. Uh, if you send a 33 kilobyte, if you uh, package a 33 kilobyte package of JSON to this little device, how long do you think it is before that turns out to be one megabyte? You know, you have to be really thinking about sending very small amounts of data. 30, if you send uh, a 33 kilobyte package to one of these devices every day, you hit one megabyte in a month. You know, so you need to think about those sorts of things. Um, you have to ask yourself whether WebSockets is necessarily the right thing or not. We hear lots of good things about WebSockets. Actually, they don't always work for a variety of reasons, uh, especially at large scale. And you need to possibly consider using PubSub. I don't know if you know about PubSub, uh, but there's a lot of uh, stuff. Uh, one of the things that I, I personally discovered was you, you can build a prototype and it kind of works. And then what really surprised me was I accidentally left one of these things on for some time and it stopped working um, after some days. Now, if you're building an M2M device, you want to make sure that this thing is going to work for a very long time, possibly 10 years, and you're not going to be able to access it for that period of time. So make sure in your testing that this thing actually works for a long time. Um, there are all sorts of reasons why it might suddenly stop working, um, from memory to power to, or to, or to other things. And the other thing that we started to discover very quickly was that many of these JS APIs um, actually, um, you know, like for example, serial port, uh, when you download it um, and you, you install it, um, you need a C compiler. Um, and if you, and you do that on a Windows machine, you need a very specific uh, C compiler. You need, um, it's Visual Studio 10. Uh, you can't use the latest one. Um, you also discover that um, even when you go from the Mac to some Linux systems, um, wh whoever's built these things has tested and debugged their code against one particular platform when they built it, and it doesn't actually work in entirety on another platform. So you may find um, these sorts of problems, and they're not documented um, at all, even in the core. So, no, no, I'm not talking about the core library, but in user, especially in user land. So, um, what we want to do here is um, w um, we have a little game. Uh, so we've built this uh, um, device down here. Um, the what's the best way of explaining this? Um, okay, so for those who want to take part in this game, you're going to need to text this number. So can you t take a note of this number, and then I tell you what we have to do. There's uh, a nice prize for the winner um, or winners. Okay, so don't send a text to this, because uh, you've got to do something in a moment. Um, so what's going to happen is, you're going to send a text with a particular number, which we'll tell you in a moment, which is going to come directly to this embed device down here. It's not going to go onto the internet or something. It's going to come to this embed device, which is down here. It's not going to an aggregator. The device is going to look at the content that you've sent and forward this on using WebSockets to a server in London. And that is then linked back to a web page that I'm going to show you. Um, when I show you that web page, so I'm, I'm sort of pausing and umming and eyeing because I want to show this. There we go. Uh, 
Okay. So everyone got that number? Good. So what you have to do is um, send a number, send a text with a number, which is between one and, I'll tell you in a second. And if you win, what's going to happen? Oh, somebody sent a number and the wrong number. And, and if you send wrong numbers, this is what is going to happen. These um, tires are going to shoot out. And if you send the right number, the Vodafone logo is going to come out of here. So send the text now between 1 and 19. So send a number which is between 1 and 19 to... So this is all happening in real time across the cellular network. And on the internet side, it's using web sockets. Uh, to speak to this web browser, which is doing uh, these, these effects using HTML5. And nobody's won yet. We've not tested this game uh, with more than two people. <laughs> Nobody said... Yeah, Ashley. I think it just reset. It flashed. Okay, yeah, yeah, it's okay. It's reset. Yeah, I did it. I think so. No, no, I'm in. Because I've got this BBC thing. Yeah, I did.
Yeah. Where did Ashley go? No. I've got. Yeah, we've no problem. Can you send? Just if, can you? Is it a? But that's strange. What they said. Can we try one more time? We'll do. Is it's this thing? Oh, that's a bit strange. Um, we still want to give the prize. So, what should we do? Okay, shout out. The first person to shout out the right number. Somebody said 16. Who said 16? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so somebody will get a, an embed processor and uh, somebody else will get a, a Vodafone dongle with a free SIM card um, with 20 euros worth of data on there. Cool. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs>